you would, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. Our passage this morning is Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 13. I'm going to open with prayer, and then we'll read our passage as we work our way through it. Father, let us revel in history, your history, your providential history. Let us see your dumbfounding ways. As we rejoice at this season in the history of the birth of your eternal Son becoming one of us and all that he accomplished and what you've been doing even the last 2,000 years. Let us, let us see, let us marvel, let us worship you in it and over it and through it to the glory of the name of Jesus. Amen. At the end of this service, we're going to obey Jesus and partake of the bread and drink the cup in remembrance of what is signified by his words. Quote, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So notice Hebrews 8, verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old. As the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. So Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. His priestly ministry we have seen of sacrificing himself once for all is the blood of the new covenant. The blood that purchased what the new covenant promises. Which means there was an old covenant. And now Jesus' blood purchases the new. And the new has much better promises. And the better promises of the new covenant are those which are prophesied by Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31, which the writer will now go on to quote. But before he gets there, he starts his argument in verse 7 now. For what? For the new is much better than the old. Verse 7, for, here's the argument, for If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion or reason to look for a second. So the better covenant, that is the new covenant, wouldn't have been needed. If the first covenant, if the old covenant were faultless, what he is saying is That if the old covenant could actually save people, if it could bring them to God, then there would have been no reason for a new covenant. And so what he does is cite Jeremiah chapter 31 to show that the Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament itself predicted a new covenant which would come 
and it would replace the old covenant. And in verse 8, he makes it clear that the problem with God's old covenant with Israel, that is, the problem with the law, and the old covenant, was not the covenant. The problem was the people. Look at the beginning of verse 8. For he, God, Yahweh, finds fault with them. That's the problem. See, in other words, the law, the old covenant, revealed God's will of how the people should live. But the law could not change their hard, rebellious hearts. As far as the law was, it was righteous and good, as Paul would say. But the law was powerless to do what every single one of those sinners and every single sinner today needs to be done, and that is to have a changed heart that would love God and love the law that He gives. And so the argument of the writer is, since God found fault with the people, therefore, through Jeremiah, He promised a new covenant. Pick up in verse 8. For he finds fault with them when he says, and now he quotes Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. When he says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant, the old one, that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Here it is. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for or because they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So first notice in the text, that the promise is that this covenant will be made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. How does that feel, Gentile? But Paul made it clear in Romans 11, there is no salvation apart from the Jews. There's only one root But he also made it clear in Romans 11 that natural Jews, natural branches of the unbelieving Israel were broken off so that you, a Gentile, could be grafted in to the root of that tree, Israel, Judah. And therefore we, whether we're Jews or whether we're Gentiles, who come to Christ, we are in the new covenant. The promises of that covenant that he made to Israel are ours. Now, 
we'll come back to what more precisely and in depth is this new covenant. We'll come back there next week. I just want this to, this is a history class this morning. And Christian, know your history. We should feel the weight as we're looking and we have Advent candles and Jesus born in 4 BC, but crucified in 33 AD. We should feel the weight of what he, that person, that ministry of Jesus, the gospel meant as an explosion within the people of Israel. And it's summarized in the next verse. Verse 13. After the quote, the writer says, In speaking of a new covenant, He makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Those words were written in A.D. 64. And as you read, and as we've been going through this whole letter to the Hebrews, these, these Jewish Christians mainly, that it's written to, the assumption behind everything is that Jerusalem, the temple, the Levitical priesthood, the sacrifices, the burnt offerings are all still presently going on during the writing of what we're reading. And this prophecy that he quoted was Jeremiah's 600 years before the writing of this, which started the countdown to a time when the old covenant with its outward forms and systems would disappear. Listen again, verse 13, carefully. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, irrelevant. And what is becoming irrelevant, obsolete, and growing old, is ready to vanish away. That is a prediction that the writer is making. The old is becoming obsolete. It is going to happen. It hasn't totally yet, at the time of the writing. Let me just pull back. We should feel, as, as fellow human beings, with those who have not been affected by the grace of the Holy Spirit in the hearing of the gospel of Jesus as a Jew in the first century, as many other brothers and fellow Jews did, they didn't. You, you got to feel historically how threatening Christianity was to the Jews to everything that they had built their lives around, culturally, ceremonially, re religiously. All the prescribed ceremonies centered in Jerusalem. Pilgrimages, if you lived in the diaspora, were made. Sacrifices were purchased and animals slaughtered. Passover washings, food laws, all of it. So go back in history, A.D. 30 to 33, what's happening there within the land of Israel and around Judea and Jerusalem is that th there are some Jews who are proclaiming that the Messiah is here. He's his Jesus 
Yeshua, Joshua from, from that little stinky town of Nazareth. But the vast majority of the Jews did not accept that message. And thus, their rejection resulted in the crucifixion of Jesus from Nazareth. And then subsequently, from the persecution and death of numbers of his followers who, who were proclaiming after his death that he was raised from the dead. Why were they so upset? Because they knew that the gospel claims were a huge threat to their way of life. Let's look at the very early history book, book of Acts for a moment. Turn to chapter 6. Remember Stephen? He's also a Jew, who now believes in Jesus, and he's preaching in the Greek-speaking synagogues throughout Jerusalem. And what, what was going on? Why was Stephen such a threat to the, to the Jews who didn't believe? Why was he such a threat to the leadership that they needed to ascertain some false witnesses to accuse him in order to get rid of him? Verse 13 and 14, Acts 6. And they, the Jews, set up false witnesses who said... This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place. They're in the temple grounds. Nor to speak against the law of Moses. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, the temple, and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Okay, okay I just want here, just try to get in, empathize for a moment. That's what Christianity meant to the Jewish leaders and thousands of other Jews. It meant to them the destruction of the old ways, of the temple service, the priesthood, the animal sacrifices, ceremonial law. It meant, as the Hebrew writer has told us here, it meant to them the vanishing, the disappearing of the first covenant. And if, therefore, if the temple... If it falls, then their religion, Judaism, as they know it, will vanish away. Judaism will become something different than what it was. No longer centered in the temple in the Levitical priesthood, in the sacrificial system of animals, with a curtain and an Ark of the Covenant and a mercy seat, it will be something different if that vanishes. And so they killed Stephen. Now, should have the, the first century Jews there really been that afraid of Stephen's message? In a sense, if, if that's what you want to hold on to, then absolutely they should have. In the Jesus sayings with his apostles and what he's teaching people, and they were there. So for instance, Jesus, he prophesied that the temple would be destroyed. In Matthew 24, verses 1 to 2, we read, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. And he answered them, 
You see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. He also predicted the destruction of the whole city of Jerusalem. In Luke 19, he said this, starting with verse 43. For the days will come upon you. Jerusalem is who he's speaking to. For days, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you. And hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground. You and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus made it clear in his sayings we've seen over these last few weeks that he's replacing the temple and the priesthood. Kill me and I will raise this temple, his body, I'll raise it up in three days. When I die, Temple system dies with it. Okay, that's essentially what Jesus was teaching. It's what he said. AD 33, he's killed. He's raised from the dead. A year goes by. Temple's still there. Seven years go by. It's still there. It's AD 40. Jump forward to AD 48. Paul's on his missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire in Asia Minor. Temple's still there. Paul finally returns back to Judea and to Jerusalem in about 56 AD. Where's he arrested? In the temple. Still there. We're almost three decades in. This letter is written in AD 64. Temple is still there. Sacrifices are still going on. But the essence of the Jesus sect within Judaism, the essence of, in other words, the gospel message, and the Jews knew it. it was, that, that's what got Paul so angry. They knew that was a threat to this whole religious System, Because at its core, it said, there is no need for the temple in Jerusalem. No need for any more sacrifices by the priest. The reality has come to replace the shadows that pointed to the Messiah. And the Hebrew writer says in our text now, in AD 64, it's ready. It's close to vanishing away. So Judaism, it had, a, it had a reason to fear the teaching of Christianity because the very, very heart of the Christian faith, faith was the inevitable end of the Jewish way of life as they knew it. We're almost 2,000 years later now, so we can look back at history, and we know that what Jesus prophesied came to pass. We know the temple and all the sacrifices and the priesthood 
all came crumbling down. So just briefly, what, what, what happened? We, we know, everyone knows, when we celebrate this, we know. <laughs> Pilate, working for Rome, we know the Jews hated the Roman occupation of their land in Jerusalem. They wanted independence, many of them. But, you know, you had, so you had little sex. But now, 30 years after Christ is crucified, three decades in, Paul's done most of his missionary journeys that we read about in the book of Acts already. The temple is still there. Paul's probably killed in the year A.D. 64 in Rome. This letter's written in A.D. 64. Two years after this letter is written, the Roman governor of Judea raided the temple treasury. And that caused a massive riot. And then it was put down. And many of the Jews there were crucified. And the governor is so angry, he let his Roman soldiers just go, go steal and take anything you want throughout Jerusalem. And that um, upped the ante. And a, not just a riot, a real revolt of the Jews happened. And they attacked the Roman fortress right next to the temple there that Pilate used in his day, and they killed a bunch of Roman soldiers. And that really got Rome's attention, and they sent the Roman general, Vespasian, with his massive army to put down the Jewish revolt. And he did throughout the land of Israel, but he didn't quite get Jerusalem yet. By A.D. 67. And then he's called back to Rome because... He's going to be the next emperor. And he leaves his son, the general Titus, in charge. And in exact fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy, he besieged the city and surrounded it and hemmed it in on every side for five months. People are starving to death. Cannibalism is most likely happening. And after five months, they break through into the walls of Jerusalem and burn the temple to the ground and destroy the city and slaughtered. According to Josephus, Josephus was a Jew who was stuck in Jerusalem at the time. Should have been killed, but he's really good with his mouth. And we know him as an historian now, first century historian. And he pleaded his case and they let him live and he became who we know him to be to write Roman history and write Jewish history, now essentially working with the Roman Empire. He tells us that 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered. And those who weren't were brought away into slavery or chased out, and the Jews no longer allowed to even be in Jerusalem. It was the end of Judaism. I mean, as it had been known. The priesthood was no more. The sacrificial system was no more. The worship life that centered around Jerusalem in the temple was over for the next 1,952 years and counting. And so having been scattered away from Jerusalem, what happened? This is, this is what happened. Judaism went through a massive change. You remember as you read your New Testament, and what are all these rules and laws? It's called the, the, the oral law, the oral tradition of the Jews that the Pharisees uh, would, would, would pass down. And it's oral. It's not written. It's memorized. And it goes from generation to generation on, you know, 87 870 different ways to keep the Sabbath, etc. So you've got these oral traditions, and now the, the rabbis and the Jewish communities who are scattered away now from Jerusalem feared that 
we could lose all of those laws if we don't get them codified and written down. And so for the next 130 years, that's what they did. And they wrote down the oral traditions. It's called the Mishnah. It was done by 200 A.D. Then over the next 300 years in different places of Jewish communities, the rabbis would debate and try to apply and say, what does this really mean? And in other words, it's like writing big commentaries on the Mishnah and, and, and biblical Old Testament passages. And that all those writings are called the Gemara. And you put those together, that is what the Talmud is, massive encyclopedia. This is what created what we know now distinctly as rabbinic Judaism since the fall of the temple in A.D. 70. Okay. A.D. 70, it had meaning. It was a horrific event. And its meaning was that it was a witness. I, look, get, I'm going to, why am I free to say this? And I'm going to, let me just, let me, let me put a parenthesis here. Anti-Semitism is utterly evil. The hatred of Jews is utterly evil. But the reason I'm free is because of the scripture. It was a witness to the truth of Christianity because Jesus predicted it and it came to pass. It was an act of divine judgment. That's what Jesus said in Luke 19 that we read. These things will happen because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't recognize or receive God the Son, the Messiah. It was God's providential testimony that the coming of Jesus was what the book of Hebrews says it was. The replacement of the shadows with the reality of Christ himself. That's what's going on in Jeremiah's prophecy. That's what's going on in chapter 8, verse 13 of our passage. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is Becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away in six years from now. Well, he doesn't know that yet, but we do. So what we see happening in redemptive history is that the old covenant, it gives way to the new covenant. And the new covenant at its core means God takes all the places and the forms and those shadows and what they pointed to, the reality, the meaning, and the law, and morality, and his moral law. He takes all of that, this is the new covenant, and he puts it into the hearts. It doesn't remain on a page, external. It goes internal. And we'll come back to that next week with the new covenant. But what now? But I just want to make sure we deal with that really crucial verse 12 this morning. Then how could God do that? In other words, what gives him the right to be so merciful with the new covenant? Which at its core means without your permission, he comes and saves you. And the answer is verse 12. For I will be merciful. 
toward their iniquities. The new covenant people. And I will remember their sins no more. Now that, that's the end of the quote of Jeremiah here in the text. It begins with the word for. I mean, here's for. Here's the foundation of what? Of, what he, of the promises of the new covenant that he just quoted. Like, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I'll write them on their hearts. Mercy. How? The death of Jesus. That's what purchased the new covenant. This is the great promise of the new covenant that God would offer us guilty sinners the greatest possible treasure in existence. His, himself in mercy. But, but that's not it though. That's not all the new covenant is. It is that. But it's not that and just leave it there. Go ahead. It's up to you whether you take it. No, the new covenant is not only that offer, but then he would move in and act upon our hearts in order that we would definitely see it and come to him and enjoy him forever. That's the new covenant. But to do that, there's a huge problem. He can't just ignore sin. And we're all dead to God. We don't like his law. We don't like that he even is in control of me. That's a problem. So God couldn't ignore that problem and just, I ah, know, whatever. Let me give you the greatest mercies available. No, he had to be just in dealing with us. I'm, if you know your Bible, you know I'm, I'm just getting this from Paul. He had to be and remain righteous while declaring us to be righteous. And the only way to do it was to reckon or impute the sins of all those who were purchased by the new covenant. To reckon or impute their sins onto Jesus on the cross and judge them there. The result of that is that he could be favorable towards all of those who are in the new covenant and deal mercifully with them forever while remaining just. That's what verse 12 means. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Aren't you glad Jesus came? A couple more candles that we celebrate and we look back. He's coming to hold that cup. So let's just put that all in a big, massive nutshell now. The inauguration of the promised new covenant with the coming and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in AD 33, it meant that the reality of the external, the outward sacrificial ceremonies in the Old Testament all of those things that they pointed to were going to penetrate the heart of God's people. And thus, the outward forms, the shadows, were destined to disappear. And so 37 years after Jesus' death and resurrection in A.D. 70, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and burned it all to the ground. 
bringing an end to the Levitical priesthood. And God was saying by his sovereign providence, Christ was the goal of the shadows. Let me just add something before I close. It's also a sovereign providential miracle that God has preserved for 2,000 years now the Jewish people. And not only that, we know that there is still a wonderful future for the Jews in and only in Jesus Christ, according to the scripture. Let me read it to you. Romans 11. Paul says it this way. I'll tell you a mystery. Mainly Gentile Christians in Rome. A partial hardening of the heart has come upon Israel. Not forever. Listen. Until the fullness of the non-Jews, the Gentiles, has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob And this will be my covenant with them. It's the new covenant. When I take away their sins. And then Paul says, Yes, as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, They are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So just as you, Gentile, were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of the Jews' disobedience, so they also have now been disobedient In order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God in his master plan has locked up or imprisoned or consigned all Jews and Gentiles to disobedience. So that... He may have mercy on all from among the Jews and the Gentiles. And so there's a sense in which the existence of Judaism even today, in in its very transformed version of it, of rabbinic Judaism, meaning without the temple, without sacrifices, without a priesthood. That's a constant witness that the first covenant has vanished away. It's actually, at this season, say it this way, it it, it testifies to Christmas. It testifies that the promised Messiah has come Jesus of Nazareth, and he has purchased and inaugurated the new covenant. Testifies that the the shadows have been, been replaced by the reality. And we now worship God anywhere in spirit and in truth. Precisely because Jesus held the cup and said, 
this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let me close in prayer as our hearts are prepared by the word of God to receive the cup, to receive the bread. Oh, Father, you're good. We thank you for your wonderful, special grace, Lord Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. In your bride, in your church, in your new covenant people. Never forgetting, but constantly turning to the cup, which was poured out for us the blood of this wonderful new covenant. Amen.